Chase Claypool for a second round pick. Your thoughts. This was my least favorite move right now. And I say this as a Justin Fields supporter. I think Chase Claypool is okay. He's like an average starter to me. I don't think he's going to transcend that. He's had enough time, but he's kind of not just a, he's not a gadget receiver, but he's somewhere kind of in between that. And I just think the draft compensation is way too high. You, you get one more year out of him. That's great. Uh, you got to evaluate Justin Fields to an extent. Fine, that's cool too. But that's currently the 43rd overall pick. I think you have close to 50-50 odds of that rookie that you're going to be drafting at that pick to be just better than Chase Claypool, and you're going to have to pay Chase Claypool earlier. And I just really just don't think that we have to play this game where adding an average wide receiver is going to truly help us evaluate Justin Fields. If your process is that we need to see Chase Claypool in the lineup to decide whether or not Justin Fields are franchise quarterback, to me is a bit ridiculous to say, and that's just like kind of just narrative hunting. I think that they should have waited uh, until the off season, like you pointed out on Twitter. Amari Cooper, these type of deals happen when there's more time to breathe and you're not feeling uh, so overwhelmed that you have to make a trade or at the move at the deadline. To me, Justin Fields already played well enough this year in the last couple of weeks where I would be giving him the next year, no matter what happens. You yeah. know, he has too much skill. You've invested into him too much. He's shown you just enough. Wait till the off season. trade, get some rookies in there. We don't need Chase Claypool. He's not going to be solving Justin Fields or the Chicago Bears. To me, this is way too rich. Many great points there. To me, the idea of Chase Claypool after his 11 touchdown rookie season has always been better than what we've seen from Chase Claypool since that rookie year, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, because you see this massive frame who creates after the catch, who's won some contested, although he's about 49% during Ben Roethlisberger's final year. Um, and you think, oh, oozes potential, alpha potential. Um, I just don't see it as a route runner. I see yeah. it mainly on crossing routes where he's building up speed again to win and, and be powerful after the catch. And then some of those manufactured touch sweeps near the goal line is where he's at his best. Um, it's also been weird like the last two seasons and it's because, you know, this team adds George Pickens where he basically played in 2020, 75% on the outside. And this year he's been 75% on the inside. Now I think in a Luke Getzey offense where we see lately a bunch of Justin Fields throws on the move, some mm -hmm. crossing route patterns, so on and so forth, like that can feed into the, you know, positives where he wins for Chase Claypool, but for a, your second round pick for the bears, not the one you just got from the Ravens. Yeah. That is super rich in the context of all these other moves for skill position players that we have seen throughout the league right now. Again, I think there is something there, but this is also a Pittsburgh Steelers team that has identified wide receiver talent so well. And it felt like from what Josina Anderson was saying, they've wanted to move away from chase yes. people for quite some time. Yeah, that's not a good sign. The best team in the league that evaluates receivers is trading you the receiver. Usually, I would have some alarm bells going. I, to me, like I think he's a big slot. I think he's better in that role. He can win on the outside if you need to. But I think Darnell Mooney is a number two. I think Chase Claypool is somewhere around a number two, number three big slot. They still need a number one wide receiver. This is not – you can't go into 2023 with Darnell Mooney and Chase Claypool. They're going to be adding to the position. Use a first-round a pick on a legit – number one wide receiver and then you find a chase claypool type of talent in free agency i know the next free agency class isn't very good find it via the draft don't make a last minute move here i really just don't understand the move especially because they just trade away roquan smith and uh their best edge rusher too this is a team clearly not trying to make the playoffs to uh that big of a degree this is for a future move and i just think this is a little bit sh short-sighted um especially when like calvin ridley is going for a future second a yeah. future second and a fifth for Calvin Ridley, and then you get Chase Claypool for a second. I don't know about that. Yeah, and you couldn't get two more different players. I mean, because Claypool's all physical and not much detail or nuance to his game. Uh, he just has to out-athlete people. And he's done that at times. You know, he's done mm -hmm. that at times for sure. It is interesting. I mean, his A dot has dropped from 13.2 in 2020 to 11.5 in 2021 to 9.45 this season. Uh I think he even said that he wanted more vertical patterns, more downfield routes. And we know that Justin Fields has the fourth highest average depth of throw so far this season. So 
they have to do something creative with him. He's not just like a plug and play. Hey, go out there and yeah. do what you do. We're going to get you the football and the timing of the offense. There has to be some creativity tagged onto it, but maybe Luke gets, can do it. Cause we've seen some new wrinkles to this team over the last two or three weeks. I think Darnell Mooney's sim like they don't like Chase Claypool and Darnell Mooney don't play like each other, but Darnell Mooney is the same thing. You got to get him scripted a little bit. He has some juice when you can get him downfield or on the move. I, I know I was pretty negative there with the bears, but I am happy. It is a fun thing for the league. Yeah. for Justin Fields to have some players around. I don't think it's the right decision for the Bears per se, but I'm excited that a team's actually trying a little bit for Justin Fields. I was worried a couple weeks ago that he was just never going to get a legit chance. At least this moved signals to me that the Bears are going to try to build around Justin Fields, that he has proven that he's worthy of that for at least one more year. Naeem Hines for a sixth rounder. So the Bills have been searching for this type of talent for a very long time, dating back to last for agent cycle. They had a contract agreed to with J.D. McKissick. He bounced at the deadline. Uh, then they go and select James Cook with their first draft pick, I believe, this past April in the second round, immediately citing J.D. McKissick and that type, and they barely have trusted him. So as we've talked about with Devin Singletary this season, he's been in in 76% of their negative or neutral game scripts. How do you think Naeem Hines fits into this backfield that now is three with Zach Moss going in the other direction as well? Just pure talent. I think he's the best running back on the team. And I, I don't think it's that close. Devin Singletary has been okay at best. Uh, he's kind of just like a, a volume sponge to me. Like right now he's bottom five in my uh, fancy points over expected model. Um, there is no like between the tackles carrier. So that's going to remain Devin Singletary. He's probably going to play the most snaps, but Naeem Hines, I think is going to be a pretty big uh, person in this offense. Maybe not in November, but I think by December in the NFL playoffs, he's going to be a big part of what they do. I think that we can see the bills basically pass the ball, like at league breaking rates, the rest of the way he can win on the outside. He can win from the backfield. He really is just a perfect fit. And like you said, they've been searching for this flair player for a couple of years now. And I think, of the types like J.D. McKissick, James Cook himself, um, some other names that they flirted out, out around with. I just think Naeem Hines like one tier above yep. all of those players as a talent. Remember our first summer doing this, we had Robert Mays on the show and we like drafted 11, uh, seven on seven teams. That was great. And I think Naeem Hines was the first back off the board because he called Naeem Hines the best route runner of any running back. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me think, because again, they keep chasing this type that we haven't even really seen how the bills want to utilize this type, you know, like Devin Singletary has been relied on as a true running back in the system and just check downs in the structure of the offense. Um, we haven't seen anything really schematic other than just a couple of James cook motioning out and then running some fades and doing that stuff. Yeah. And we'll get to James cook in a little bit, but Naeem Hines can do a lot more crazy stuff than that. Like yep. this is almost a budget version of, of Christian McCaffrey in the passing game where you get someone on angle routes against linebackers or safeties, true patterns. When you motion them out and go empty out of empty, you can get Josh Allen to then run the ball as well. Um, again, despite trying to find this type of player, I don't know if we've even seen this section of the playbook from the Buffalo bills. And that is already scary when we're in week eight and this is a top three offense in the league. I just see this like when they're going to face a bunch of too high coverage instead of running the ball out of that look. Now you're going to have these option routes uh, like that one against like linebackers where there's space to the left or the right of you because you have too high safety. So it's just a, it's just a great fit now for fantasy purposes. I think that I would, I'll probably end up be ranking Devin Singletary slightly ahead of Naeem Hines. But the RB2 days that Devin Singletary was getting, I think, are pretty much over. Maybe you get another mm. week or two of those. But I just think that he was so, so, so volume dependent because he's not like a big play threat. He was he was catching some passes in some games. Sometimes he wasn't. The goal line stuff just doesn't always end up working out for him to that degree. So I think that I'm going to probably be ranking him as like RB 26 or somewhere around there uh, once Naeem Hines is integrated and probably Naeem Hines like as an RB 33, something like that. I would be ranking Naeem Hines in waiver wire stuff very high just because I do think he's the insurance option as well. We've seen the Colts sprinkle in Naeem Hines whenever JT misses. And I think that in this Bills offense, he can for sure see 80% of the snaps. It's a way different offense than what the Colts are doing. I think that's going to play right into the high end skill set. So I think he should be rostered basically in every single league. 
Should we have a quick James Cook conversation here? Because I brought this up last night during Monday Night Football when it sounded like Naeem Hines was going to get dealt. That, to me, it made the most sense for the Buffalo Bills to make this deal. Immediately got feedback of, well, what does that mean for James Cook? Are they already giving up on him? After that first game, it was so clear that this team could not trust James Cook. You know, he only played in garbage time situations. Sure, you can throw week eight at me um, at where he got, you know, six touches, few yeah. of those, three of those, I think were in the second quarter. Then he didn't touch the ball again until the fourth quarter. Um, that was after the bye. That was with Zach Moss as an inactive player. And it just felt like from, again, a zooming out a grand scheme of things, they've never been able to trust James Cook. So with a team that is in their window to win, that has wanted a player with this type of skill set that is actually difficult to find, this trade for nothing, a six rounder, makes so much sense. So much sense. Looking at Naeem Hines' contract right now, he's 26 years old. Next year, he has no guaranteed money in 2024, no guaranteed money. He's ba basically making like $5 million per, uh, which is not crazy running back money at all. That's kind of like a Chase Edmonds type of deal, but I just think that Naeem Hines has proven to be better than Chase Edmonds by a lot. Miami Dolphins, you know, they shipped away Chase Edmonds, who when you look at rushing yards over expectation was the worst in the league. You know, on average, he was leaving about, let's just say over two yards on the field on each and every carry. That's hard to do. So they ditch him and they bring in Jeff Wilson, who is top seven in that category. And look, I'm not saying rush yards over expectation is a perfect statistic, but at the simplest level, when you get rid of the player who is worst on that list and bring in someone who is top 10 on that list, that's a positive. So yep. What we've seen from Raheem Mostert over these last few weeks, he's dominating the backfield opportunities. Do you expect that to change, bringing in Jeff Wilson, who obviously has a lot of history with Mike McDaniel? So I think Raheem Mostert was practically maxed out, just like given his age, size, injury history. He played like 65% of the snaps. I think that's the sweet spot for Raheem Mostert, 50 to 65% of the snaps. I think he will remain the 1A because I think that Raheem Mostert has been good. Jeff Wilson swapping in for Chase Edmonds, like you said, is technically bad news for Raheem Mostert, but I don't think it's going to be that drastic of a difference. I'll still be ranking Raheem Mostert as like an RB2-3, kind of depending on the matchup. Uh, Jeff Wilson should know the exact offense. Uh, Jimmy G and Tua are starting to look more and more similar to me as the season progresses. So um, good news for Jeff Wilson because Eli, Eli Mitchell was coming back and he was obviously got cucked by Christian McCaffrey. Um, but I think it's a smart move for for the Dolphins. I mean, a fifth round pick seems like a little bit rich, but it's a day three pick. And they're trying to win a, a Super Bowl this year. They're all in. Yeah. What we saw with the Bradley Chubb trade, what we saw with this move is the team goes from trying to acquire a lot of picks to now willing to get rid of a lot of picks, which shows you a difference in, in their mentality, which I think is great. You know, it now shows you that they believe Tua is their guy. Like, and he has proven to be that. Let's talk about this Calvin Ridley trade, which does not impact the team in 2022, but should be a lot of fun here in 2023. Give us your take. This is like the exact move that the Chicago Bears should have done. You're trading a 2024 second round pick and next year's uh, fifth round pick, essentially, if things go right. But both teams would be happy if it's a future second and next year's fifth round pick. That's exactly what Trevor Lawrence needs. Next year, Calvin Ridley's only making $11 million. That's Adam Thielen, Robert Woods type of money here, not breaking the bank. Then they'll extend him after if he has a good season here. I think it's the perfect move. We knew the Falcons weren't going to be uh, keeping Calvin Ridley. Yep. Do it now before there's more teams involved next year. And he's like a true number one receiver on the outside. It also puts Christian Kirk into a better role where instead of seeing nine targets a game, now that's six or seven and it's more design stuff. And he doesn't have as much pressure on him. And Trevor Lawrence hasn't been throwing as many deep balls uh, as what we had hoped, like actually like really down the field. And Calvin Ridley obviously brings a ton of that. So build around your franchise quarterback uh, while he's relatively cheap. And I think Calvin Ridley was a very, very good move. And he seems happy with the landing spot goes back to Florida. Oh yeah. He's already sent out a montage of him oh, in yeah. a Jacksonville Jaguars Jersey. Yeah. I think anyone who, who followed the situation with Calvin Ridley in Atlanta knew he was never going to play another down for the yep. Falcons. Um, that was the Genesis of the move in the first place when he was linked with the dolphins. And then apparently a, a deal was agreed to with the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, in Rappaport, kind of outlined how complicated this trade is like it can be a 
a 2023 fifth rounder. If he's like reinstated, that can then go up to like a 2024 second rounder. If he signs a contract mm-hmm. extension with the, with the Jaguar. So it's like, I've never seen a draft pick associated to a possibility of signing an extension, but I think because of how complicated this situation is, it does make a lot of sense in that regard. Just to dovetail your point, um, there has been no verticality, no explosiveness to the Jaguars offense at all here yeah. at all. And even though Christian Kirk was a vertical slot player in Arizona, it's not, he's not playing that role right now with, with the Jaguars. I mean, just 10.1% of his passes have gone deep this year, which is which ranks 22nd in the league. Now you bring in the player who was second in 2020 in terms of 20 plus yard targets with 36 in Calvin Ridley, a true number one who wins on the outside. Sure. We can get really hyped about this. Now it's two years basically removed from football. I truly hope that Ridley is in shape and shows up because if that's the case, this is a really, to use this word again, shrewd move by the Trent Balky yep. and, and the Jaguars that could really, really hit for them. They're going to be very fast. Travis Etienne, Kirk, and Calvin Ridley, that is, that's some serious speed. Minnesota Vikings, they make a move for TJ Hawkinson. There's a lot of layers to this deal. At first, I thought like four picks were going in the direction of yeah. the Minnesota Vikings, but that is not the case. I'll pull it up right here. So the Vikings get TJ Hawkinson, a fourth round pick and a fourth round pick. Then the lions get a second round pick, I believe in 2023 and a third round pick in 2024. Um, So on some level, Hayden, they move back two rounds and then a round. But I think how I'm going to phrase this is TJ Hawkinson for a second round pick. And we leave it there. What do you think about the move? That's, that's what like the, the the trade charts kind of equal out. It's like somewhere in the second round here. So, um, I think it makes sense for the Vikings because the Vikings have a little bit of a window here. There's uh, the Kirk Cousins under contract. They're six and one. The NFC's kind of up for grabs. And TJ Hawkinson stylistically fits what I think Kevin O'Connell wants from a tight end compared to Irv Smith, who's more undersized, more of like a H back type. And TJ Hawkins is definitely a traditional. Um, and they can get Tyler Higby type screens going to TJ yep. Hawkins. He definitely has enough wiggle. For all that, I don't think he's an elite player, but he's certainly a good player. Um, I don't think this is good for his fantasy stock um, just because there's better options to throw the ball to, uh, in my opinion. But uh, I think I understand the move from the Vikings end. Now, I think the real debate is, do you want Hawkinson to build for the, I'm assuming there's going to be a rookie quarterback next year, or would you rather have a second round pick? Um, I can kind of see the conversation going either way there. I think it just kind of determines like your evaluation of Hawkinson. I think he's a good, but not great player. Yeah. A few layers to this. Um, Kirk cousins has the third lowest percentage of pass attempts of 20 plus yards this season, 6.8. Like everything is really condensed on this offense. So they've been needing to win in like the short to intermediate game, even with Justin Jefferson on their team. That makes sense when TJ Hawkinson, you know, 65% of his targets are one to 10 yards down the field. And it also makes sense that he is what sixth, I believe, excuse me, fifth among all tight ends in yards after the catch per reception at 8.8. Now you're seeing it on all the highlights on YouTube right now. Many of those are either screens or just a couple of big plays that maybe, you know, change the averages over these last few weeks, despite TJ Hawkinson being a top 10 player, I believe in the real NFL draft. I haven't seen that type of bona fide talent like we've seen from some others. But at the same time, second teams, second contracts, this is kind of when, you know, tight ends start to develop. I've really liked how Kevin O'Connell has um, created mismatches for Justin Jefferson when you see cover one or, or cover three. And while, you know, KJ Osborne had moments last week, while we've seen Adam Thielen have a couple more moments, this brings another element or another mismatch or another pass catcher, especially when you consider that Irv Smith just went on IR for eight to 10 weeks. Yeah, I think the Vikings are just underrated. So I, I do like this move. This makes the, the NFC uh, definitely more interesting. Mm-hmm. 